Like and subscribe for more info on products, sales, and training with Pierre Finkelstein. Shop work, shop talk. We're basically we're talking about tools and things like that. Again, uh, even though I say I will restrain myself from talking more than two seconds, I seem to have a lot to say on every subject, and it goes on forever. Uh, which me? All right. So let's go. Faye. Faye ask, which medium do you prefer for? Do you prefer for residential work, oil over acrylic? Acrylic, no question. Especially in New York, the VOC laws laws are gonna hit every single state and you have to use low VOCs. Uh, the new product uh, out on the market now are pretty good. And uh, as a result, they've gone better. They're, you're not gonna get more than 20 minutes open time. I mean, you, you, you have to work faster. You have to work with more efficiently. You have to work with a system, uh, but it's all benefit to you. You work faster. You, if you work faster, you essentially make more money. Uh, you, you'll be more efficient. So uh, acrylic for me has been now 90% of the work. And I'll go back to oil. If, I, if we do some wood grain, something where the yellowness of the oil or the smell is not a problem and that I can have somebody glaze ahead of me and, you know, especially for grain, for, mar for wood graining, uh, I find it that, you know, I can have two or three panel glazed ahead of me and I just grain them and, and move around. So it's just a matter of ease. Uh, the, the point I want to make, because this question comes back in different forms throughout. So, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just going to uh, uh, insert all of them at once is that the, um, I'm reading something as I'm saying that, uh, you, the most important thing is that when you do a work, <clears throat> if I do a walnut, you, you shouldn't be able to tell what product I use. If you, if, uh, if you do, I failed somewhere. At the end of the day, the walnut is going to look like walnut. The granite antique marble is going to look like granite, whether it's water, whether it's oil, whether it's, it's, it's gouaches, whatever it is. If you can't tell right away how it was done, you failed along the way. And when I have students in the shop, I, I, I put a bunch of sample. I decorate the entire wall space with, with different sample. And some are, were done. 25 30 years ago some as recently as last week and i always my first thing introduction after you know we talk i say tell me which one is water which one is marble which one is water and marble which one is which one is water and marble water and oil uh which one is oil and water which one is all oil which one is oil and if you and nobody can tell and the and even i have a hard time remembering like, i don't remember actually how i did this and the reason is because no matter at the end of the day, when you do put them side by side, if, if it's walnut that we're teaching, it has to look like walnut. Now there are some telltale, there's some characteristics that are gonna be easier to do on certain medium and you have to use, you can't have water behave like oil and you cannot have oil behave like water, that's it. But you use the medium based on its characteristic and use it fully. So that's it, if you, if you need, a two hour open time because you're working on a hot sun outside 10 meters up and it's a long panel, you're gonna have to use oil. There's, there's no other question. Or you're gonna do dry on dry technique, which, which is gonna you know, be visible from a while. Uh, so that, that's, that's my, that was my short answer <laughs> to that one question. Uh, all right, uh, water-based, all right, what water-based product you switch in place of oil. Okay, well, again, I read, so we, we, we've we helped develop with uh, Golden, their Proceed line, now it's called Golden Pro. So anyway, it's a, it's a waterborne glaze that's uh, slow drying. It's, it's great at a, at a lot of things, and, and there is some drawback in some of the things, but uh, they are, they, you have a lot of manufacturer that do different thing. I, I, I would stay away from industrial glaze. And when I say that is like things that Benjamin Moore does or Sherman Williams, and there's nothing wrong with them. They're a really good company for the most part, but they're not a specialized company. So they're going to look at, 
you know, how much does this cost and what can we sell it for? And if it, you can sell it for $100, but it costs us only $10, that's what they'll do. A uh, smaller company like Full Effect, for instance, which has a very good product uh, for glazes, uh, uh, Golden, which are my favorite uh, personally, uh, and other Modern Master or something, Radcliffe in England, they have another good one. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's, you know, uh, there's some Italians that are coming with some really good glazes as well. Uh, so you got to, whatever you're, you're comfortable. I, I like about Golden is it's a small company. It's upstate New York. So we kind of, you know, help our, our economy there. And there, you can actually pick up the phone and talk to somebody. And, and, and if you have a special technique or request, they'll make it. They, they do small batches. So uh, it's an employee on sort of the Ben and Jerry of the paint system. So it, it's got a lot of pluses for me. And I really like the owner. He's a really good man. Uh, so that helps me make my decision on what I use, but that's what I use. And, you know, and we sell it by the way <laughs> at our store. So go get some acrylic glaze. Uh, also the, the, aside from that joke, the quality of their pigment, what they put in their paint, and they're not cheap, but the quality of the pigment, the load base is extraordinary for, for, for an, an professional, not artist, fully artist uh, paint. So uh, that's why. All right. What is whiting and its purpose from David? Whiting is ground chalk, essentially. It's um, calcium carbonate. So uh, it's, it's, it's marble dust of white marble. It's a good filler. It's what makes the glaze thicker. That's what we use it for. And you can use it as a matting agent as well. But it's essentially, it's a thickener that, that is inert. You can mix it in oil, in water, in, in, in um, shellac if you want. It doesn't matter. Uh, it just completely, um, it has no color. When it's called whiting, it has the word white in it. It's transparent unless you exceed 30%. And then you have a, 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 a stucco instead. What is the best glaze extender product on our project? Uh, from Judy, I will be applying wood graining finish on a large 16 feet beam suspended across the cathedral ceiling in a rather dry condition and working alone. First of all, good luck, Judy. <laughs> oh, here you are. It's amazing. What has that? Whenever I talk about somebody, their face pop up. It's just luck. Anyway, so Judy, first of all, I say, get somebody to help you. That's the first thing I would tell you. Uh, uh, the second thing is that 16 feet is a long beam. So don't do all three sides at once. I'm, I'm imagining it's a three centimeter. So do the bottom and then the side. And the bottom is the one you're gonna see the most. So that's the one you wanna do the nice element. The sides, you can be more of a grain. Now, if it's that higher up in the air, you have to also be a lot bolder. Don't, um, uh, don't work detailed because you have to look at, basically make your sample and stand away from it from 15 feet. You're gesturing something. I don't know what. Oh, here it is. The sample. I see. It's hard to tell with the with the with the camera, but you you have to um, make your 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 veining and your design more obvious. And to really do tell, is you paint your sample, set away twenty feet, and see if you can see them. So you, you might be a little heavier. So tools are getting a little bigger. Use those wide spalter, tooth spalters to really get a nice edge into it. Work trans work with a lighter base coat <clears throat> so there's more contrast with your glaze. And then bring it down with the final glaze so you have a nice strong color. Uh, but I would say this also, use an oil base coat <clears throat> that will give you a longer open time. I see what you're doing there. Yeah, there's, it's, it's got a good visual. Uh, which I would the sheen though, uh, Judy there, because uh, uh, traditionally beams up on that high will be almost dead matte, no sheen, because that's the, they would never be polished, it would be kind of a rough. So, and, and the sheen kind of distract from the local, so go more matte. And uh, use an oil-based coat, that'll give you the most open time. And you, what, another trick we do is we use a slip coat, so now we take our glaze, our proceed glaze, 50% water, 50% glaze, mix it up and use a spray bottle and spray, spray your bean. So the, so the water, so 
you're putting it, you're, you're, just, you're, you're creating moisture when there is none. And then you glaze and glaze with a roller. This is like a microfiber roller, so you over thick. The, the open times comes from, from two main factors, the thickness of your film and the humidity level. So already the humidity level by using oil-based coat plus the slick coat, you're gonna have a good amount, it's gonna stay that. And then the second thing is that you build up a nice thick glaze. It's gonna look a little, it's a little harder to work, but you're 16 feet in the air, you should be fine. And get some help, please. All right, uh, another from Judy. Have you found certain product that will uh, allow better prediction when wood graining or marbleizing? Uh, allowing more layer of glaze. Again, I like, you may want to consider working in oil in this, that type of environment because you'll have two hours of open time. But if you're not familiar with it, I would stay with water. Again, look for long open time, probably make some sample with the exact product you're gonna use up there. Don't, don't experiment that high up. Um, that was just a stain. I use the Minwax stain. I'm, again, you're, you're, you're in the danger zone with there with the stain okay. because, you, be, because stain requires penetration. Over and I know, oh, yeah. like uh, the the Marx school used to teach that like that, which is fine on the small sample or furniture. That's okay, but on a long scale like this, by the time you applied this, if you're going to use an oil-based system, use use three turpentine, one linseed oil, some Japan dryer, and and oil tubes, and then you're going to have two hours open time, blendable and things like that. The stain is 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 a bad acrylic essentially. That requires uh -huh. penetration. So remember that's it, it, you're you're doing you're using a product to do something it was not designed for. It, it's designed to penetrate into wood, wipe it off. That's not what you're doing. So if you're doing stain and you and you're again, if you're happy with a particular system and you master it, stick with it. You don't you don't need my advice. But I but I think on that type of thing, you, you're going you're gonna to struggle with the you know, smell, you're going to struggle with a lot of issues, and the fact that that product is not designed for that. However, if you like the stain and the colors, and you're very happy. Water-based stain. It was the water-based stain. But. It's even worse. Okay. <laughs> I thought you were sucking about oil. <laughs> <laughs> They're designed to flash dry really fast and to okay. penetrate. They're okay. not designed to be moved the way you do it. I mean, and I'm and I'm happy you did it on the sample. I think on a on a 16 footer, you're gonna you're gonna really be uh, sorry. But okay, thank you. <laughs> if you if you're happy with it, because it's water based, and now I know the fact, you could still add some proceed some of that uh, 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 glazing medium okay. that would extend the open time. That that will work. Again, do an experiment. That usually the if the pH is, 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 is compatible and it should be, you shouldn't have no problem. But again, you're forcing a product to do something it's not designed for. You, you're driving with the foot on the gas pedal and the brake at the same time. Uh, so, I, I, but if that's the way you drive, then <laughs> and you never done it. I've not accident. done this yet. I've not done a big job like that. So, so try, try, try a slow drying glaze. I think you, you'll find it a lot more enjoyable, and also the viscosity will be a lot more pleasing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Moving on. In your art of full, the wood graining recipe calls for some traditional materials, but we like to use modern set again. Uh, water based glaze would be the the answer uh as i say i like our our, our uh proceed uh, golden pro so they're 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 great for that but any good quality small batch made that you're happy with the the, the stick with that that's fine essentially at the end if you're doing one particular thing it has to look like what it is regardless of the medium Okay, let me let me shuffle through some other people. I'm just looking at the same people. There's Scott now. I'm looking at. Uh, all right, uh, our biggest job site issue. Ah, Maria. Uh, our biggest issue uh, issues usually involve tape pull. What have you found? Uh, That's a good question. What have you found a good, very low tag tape uh, other than frog or purple? used to get great one on Amazon, but the formula changed. How should I, we specify the paint contractor 
to prep the wall to avoid this problem? Any specific brand of primer? Whew, ooh, that's a good question. How to get them not to spray since the spraying makes a fine mist or powder, blah, 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 blah. I know someone named, but so heartbreaking to tape. <clears throat> wow, that's a long question. So uh, the tape tool has to do with mostly uh, the bad preparation. So it's the primer that does not adhere to your substrate. Uh, and often is the case when you put a water-based primer or latex primer when the skin coat has not fully cured and there's no penetration. So the film is on top. And as soon as you pull your tape, the weakest link being the primer ver to the um, uh, uh, substrate, the drywall this way, and it pulls. Uh, there's not a whole lot of you can do except request first of all that they uh, paint their uh, base coat only or primer only when the wall is cured that's number one uh, request an oil primer which tends to penetrate deeper into your substrate rather than form a plastic film and I'm over exaggerating if oil is not the because you're in California if I'm not mistaken you can the one of the primer I like best is called Styx S T Y X X, and that primer has really strong resiliency and is sandable. Uh, and and then uh, you know uh, apply the again if you respect the curing time of each level, it should alleviate a lot of it. Also, the way you pull your tape might be a problem. Don't pull the tape like a bandit. Um, we we'll try to demonstrate with a piece of paper with a receipt. So I'm gonna do it this way. So let's say this is my tape. And what I do is I put, uh, where's my hand? I don't know if I can do that. It's hard to tell, but I'll do it on my shirt. Here we go, that's probably better. When I remove my tape, I, I fold the tape on itself and put my finger in the back like this. There we go, like that, at 45 degrees. So instead of doing this, what I do is I do this, 45 degree, and I pull, so that this part touches this part. So there's very little movement. You see how I'm doing that? And little by little, I'm pulling down, I'm pulling down, I'm pulling down. And that there's the least amount of surface tension to remove your surface. As far as tape, I think, you know, with your frog and your purple, you're some of the best low tack tape. The other thing I've done in the past, if it's really an area that's dangerous, you get a hair dryer and heat your tape a little bit, and it softens the adhesive of the tape, so it releases a little better. The drawback is it actually also softens, if it's a water-based system, it also softens the actual base coat, and it may also uh, cause a lot of damages, all right? That's my answer. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, what uh, measure do you take to keep brushes clean on the job site? Many times I'm using the same brush for hours and then drive home an hour uh, is another hour. Uh, what curious what you deal with? Okay, good. I think it's Teresa in that. The name is not on there, but I think it's Teresa if I remember correctly. So let me try to get Teresa back. On here, there we go, Teresa. All right. Um, so uh, one of the thing is with acrylic, they, they're friendly because they they they're easy to clean, but they dry extremely fast. So you essentially have to clean your brush constantly. There's no secret about that. So what I do is I you don't have to wash them as in soap, but every twenty minutes or half an hour, I dip them in a bucket of water shake them out, wring them out, and then use them. So there's constantly moisture at the key point, which is the heel. I don't have any brush here, but the, there's the handle, there's the ferrule, and there's the hair. So where the, where the hair, I'm using a pen, it's useless. <laughs> where, where the pen touches, where the hair touches the metal part that, that holds it together, it's called a ferrule, that's where the paint dries the fastest. So you always, when I use a brush, first thing I do, <laughs> when it's what I dip it in water and wring it out. So now that heel is loaded and the, and, the, and the hair is acclimated to a moisture system. 
if it's oil, there's nothing to do. You don't need to put paint thinner in it, that's whatsoever. And constantly washing by running into water rather than soap. As soon as, if you don't have time to soap them before you put them in a plastic bag, a Ziploc with a paper towel or a wet rag, the moisture content around it will prevent the air from sucking it. And even if it's a, an hour drive, you can also actually put water in your Ziploc if, that, if you could do that. And then the, the, the rag maintains moisture around the hair so it won't dry. And that way you, 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 you'll do a clean. But the, the key thing is you're constantly should be rinsing, not washing, but rinsing your brushes. Uh, and on sun and dry where you'd use a stipple and you want it dry, not wet, I would have two or three stippler and then we wash down, it's drying, I use a new one and then wash down and get another one. So I always have a, a new stippler and, and there's always one that's either being washed or drying before being used, all right? Uh, our biggest, okay, how do, uh, wh what measure do you take now? Okay, um, how did you find a transition from oil to acrylic? Uh, how did I find it? Quite by accident, I'm saying no. Um, it was tough, but again, it made me a better painter. I think um, because the acrylic I used at, you know, 25 or so years ago, almost, yeah, maybe almost 30 years ago, in, in the 90s, uh, and I started using acrylic, it, the open time was five minutes. So it, it forced me to be a better painter quickly because I didn't have the option to blend. So the transition was tough, but when, when 10, 10, 15 years ago, we, you know, we helped Golden develop their slow drying acrylic based on certain principle we wanted, knowing that the cap of the open time would be 20 minutes. I've already had, I, I don't need 20 minutes generally to do a, a panel of a wood grain. I, I don't need that much time. So for me, it was not a big a problem. But having worked with a non with a fast drying acrylic, then you learn how to paint faster and be more precise. So the transition was not a transition where you try to, as we're talking to Judy, like force a material to do something it was not designed for. You, you adapt your technique to the material. Once you understand that, <clears throat> you could pretty much work with, with a lot of different things. Uh, do you recommend Brenda Riccoli? I talked about that. Uh, do you make your own cut rollers? David Spatz. I don't know what you mean by your own cut rollers. If it's wood graining, I don't use, I, I don't use uh, rubbery because they do a print that's always the same. So I don't like that, except when we do a job that where it has to look like an old colonial graining and then you have to match that. But uh, I, I cut a lot of tools where I took a rubber sole or plastic rubber and cut teeth into it, different diameter and something to create certain veining. That, that I cut a lot. Depending, it's, again, I was talking about this uh, industrial sponge. I cut it <coughs> in section and create a pattern and for creating mahogany or striped mahogany worked really well. So I'm constantly trying to innovate. Even some brushes, I cut hair out of it so it fits only a one inch gap between a styles and a molding. So I take one of my brush, sacrifice it. Sometime I cut the handle so I can go behind a toilet or whatever it is, that type of thing. Constantly, you know, altering a tool to fit the job. Most of my work, ah, George Caldwell. George, I think I've seen the George somewhere. I don't know where George is. I think he had to go, but I can let him know the answer. Uh, I'm saw. sorry. <laughs> Well, forget about it. <laughs> uh, what was the George question? Uh, most of our work is in oil. I'm always cautious whenever I want to spattering effect. Which brush could I recommend for spattering and stippling oil? We'll send you a link, uh, Denzel. You, 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 you use, we have that special spattering brush that's just done for spatter, whether oil or water works both. So that's one tool. Uh, any short hair brush uh, that has kind of wide volume, almost a stencil brush could also work. We can send you a link to that. Um, that's it. How, uh, also, I could really see myself using some of your veiner and brush or brush. 
is their video demo. All right, Rodney, yes, we, we, we're putting a bunch of videos for all those brushes. Ah, this is a good question, uh, Jenny, 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 uh, 10 most used brushes and tools, top ones can you, you cannot live without. <clears throat> so uh, here is my list. Drum roll, please. Uh, I actually had that conversation with Denzel uh, a couple hours ago and uh, in no particular order, but um, we've got to publish that list. Again, we'll send you an email with all that list, but for sure a glazing brush, that's the tool I use the most around the glazing brush, pointed preferably whether we have those new blue hair brush that are absolutely phenomenal because they keep their shape really well in water. Uh, but even the old bland bristle, bristle and nylon are superb in the uh, water system. So that's my number one. Second one I use the most, spalters. Right? To stretch your glaze, to do your strie, to apply your varnish. To So that's my, I cannot do any job without a, a glazing brush or spalter. Uh, so spalters are very flat and short hair and very thin. I mean, think compared to a regular brush and usually short hair. So, and some of our tooth, so they're cut out so you can create a, a nice strie. Some of our longer hair for a little flatter type of thing. Those, uh, we'll post those, but those are my top two. Uh, another one that I love uh, is the, what I call four in one. It's a spalter with long hair. It's very, very thin. I use it as a blender. I use it for strie. I use it for patina. Uh, I use it even as a blender, it's a superb brush. And uh, I realized in the last 10 years, I used one, I could see on my board which are the most used and I always use these brushes. Uh, a cut tail, a cut tail is almost like a spelling with the extra long hair and I use it as a stippler. It's, there's no better stippler for me. A block stippler, but there's narrow one so it fits in your hand, I use a lot. Uh, and then in the specialty tools, uh, tools that are you know more uh, detailed, I, I have a round badger that I absolutely love, uh, which which is badger but it's round shaped. So any which way you use it, it never leaves a mark. I really love that. Uh, I, I have a good collection also of marble brushes that I use a lot, even for other thing in marble. There there's Samina hair. There's long, thin synthetic that looks like sable, but it's synthetic. And they're they have a really great spring. So for marbling, they're superb. And I always have two or three kind of sables. I love the sable as a as a great pointy or flat or lettering brush as a way to finish things up with. Uh, I striping brush. You know, I, I, my list goes on, <laughs> but these are my top ten. Let's just say we'll publish that. I think I went through that, but. It might be 12, but those are the things always in my kit, no matter what I do. I just want to mention you forgot duster. Because we talked yes. about dusters. Uh, we talked about that because I realized it's one of those unsung hero of the decorative. Thing. I use a duster constantly, but because I don't paint with it, I just dust with it. I never use it as it, but I cannot do a job without a duster. And people make the mistake of using their spalter or their stippling brush to dust or surface. And now it's full of dust. So when you start stippling, whatever you gather out of the floor goes onto your wall, which is the thing is like, so having a dedicated duster is a, a primo, primo, primo. Uh, favorite product we did, uh, where do you buy? Where, ah, oh, this is the best question, Christina. Where do you buy your tools? <laughs> Thank you for this question. Finally, somebody had some foresight. Uh, I buy them at fullbrushes.com. <laughs> Wait. I was prepared. Watch this. For those, all of you that wear that for the Q&A, you're going to get one of those little coupons. So you can get one of those little bags, my, my little mini tote. So <clears throat> fullbrushes.com, that's where I get my thing. But anyway, the, I'm making a joke about it. But anywhere you can find a tool that's useful, is a good place. I found some of the weirdest tool, as I say, in 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 a hardware store, things you know, in a bottom of a shop full of dust because somebody didn't know what it was for. And I found some really interesting tools that way. So that's where I get my tools. Uh, best time saving tip. Best time saving tip. I should have thought about that. 
Um, you know what the best time saving tip is? Being organized. It really, I mean, uh, I recently had a French kid there that worked for me for a while, for, for a couple of months uh, until he had to be shipped back because of the pandemic. But, and he's been painting for three or four years. He's never washed a brush once in his entire life. And he went to an apprenticeship. And I said, how is that even possible? He said, because cleaning takes more time. It costs more on labor than actually buying a new brush. And, and in France, you know, brushes are, you know, glazing brushes especially are somewhat inexpensive. <clears throat> and I, I was baffled. And I said, but what about, you know, these, we work for some good reputable companies. That they bring brand new tools that are being out of the thing throw everything in the trash at the end, not keep one thing. Don't even even try. So, uh, you know, I had to show him how to br clean a brush, basically, essentially. Uh, so the best saving tip is to be organized and be thorough. So you may think that you waste time by taping off, by protecting the floor, by setting up a nice shop, but essentially you're gaining time because you, once that is done, maybe it takes a day, maybe, you know, sometimes it's, it, it is an effort. But when you pull your tape, and nothing comes off, the line is crisp, the, everything goes into the trash, you got all your tools, you're ready for the next job, that's where you make your, your money. So uh, the, the best saving time is to be very organized, very thorough in your work. From everyone here at Faux Brushes, thanks for tuning in.